morning. <laughs> All right, like Viva said, my name is Taylor Paladna. I am the president of the Colorado School of Mines, Engineers Without Borders, and Bridges to Prosperity chapter. We're actually a joint chapter between EWB and B2P. Um, today I'll be presenting on EWB USA best practices, and hopefully I'll illuminate um, the perspective of a student chapter to typically people in this room being executives and offer some perspectives in that way. I um, will be focusing on the Las Trancas pedestrian footbridge we constructed in June 6th of 2014, uh, just this past summer. Um, so the main question I'd like to address throughout the presentation is how do you get from an initial site and an initial project or potential project? Um, in our case, we had a river that floods three months out of the year. Um, cuts off ad access to education, health care, and free markets for the citizens. So how do you start with this initial project or project idea and conclude with the finished product? Uh, this is a 30-meter pedestrian footbridge that we constructed. A brief outline, I'll be covering a brief project overview, uh, followed by best practices in terms of financial, community relations, and logistical support. And then hopefully I'll offer you some worthwhile takeaways at the end of the presentation. So I'll run through a quick timeline. Our initial community contact was back at the beginning of the year of 2013. I was actually during uh, the phase one implementation of a Los Gomez pedestrian footbridge. It's one week, the first bridge we constructed as a chapter. Uh, we were approached by La Conquista, the community we worked in, and um, they said, hey, can you come over and construct a similar project for us, or would you consider this in our community? A few months later, we ran a pre-assessment trip, conducted social surveys, um, as well as a few small community meetings to gather kind of the interest and the ways we could help them. We concluded um, with to do a bridge, essentially. Uh, we ran an assessment trip in August, uh, middle of August 2013. And here we are conducting a social survey. Um, also did several community meetings that I'll talk about in a moment. And then we had a, a bit of a gap for about eight months. We were looking for funding and trying to develop our financial resources. Now, you mentioned that there's quite a significant timeline between when you completed an assessment trip and when you went in for the implementation trip. And so obviously some sort of design was happening um, for the team to come up with a system that it was going to implement. Was right. the community in any way at all involved with this decision making? Were they communicating with you throughout the process for the technical design itself? Uh, for the technical design, not so much. Um, we did hold, we do hold phone calls with them every other week, and we basically touch up or contact them and see uh, any social issues that have come up, and if, you know, at this point now that the bridge is completed, we're looking at, you know, are there any issues with the bridge? Um, but no, the technical design actually came through Bridges to Prosperity and their resources, and we've utilized them heavily for the bridge designs. Um, they're a great organization in that way. We tend to use the uh, sustainable community development model of Engineers Without Borders and then apply the technical resources for bridges from Bridges to Prosperity. And luckily, at the end of April, we received our funding from the Alcoa Foundation, um, as well as CH2M Hill. And both of those resources allowed us to implement in less than two weeks after receiving those funds. So it was a very quick turnaround. In your presentation, you mentioned that there was a very short turnaround of only two weeks between when you received your grant funding from Alcoa and CH2M Hill, and when you went to the community to implement the project. How were you able to turn around so fast between getting the funding and actually taking your team abroad to Nicaragua? So we completed our assessment trip back in um, August of, the middle of August of 2013, and we had about a nine month period before we implemented the project. Um, so during that time period, we had all of the planning, um, the bridge design, um, community engagement and involvement, and um, setting up so that if, we, if and when we did receive the funds, it would be very quick turnaround. Uh, basically, all that we had to do was send um, an appropriate sum of money down to our in-country contact, NECA Impact, and they actually controlled the funds for us in-country. They purchased all the materials through their, uh, excuse me, through their organization, and um, as such, as soon as we had that money down in-country, we purchased airfare the moment we received those funds from other accounts, and then uh, we were able to implement directly after. Um, we completed our final project. Another picture. So how did we grow our finances? Um, the first thing I'd like to say is it's very difficult um, as a first or an early young chapter to really start up. Uh, and it, like a new business or anything, getting an initial investment is very hard. In this case, is very hard. Maybe not so much uh, for business necessarily. But it took us six years to move from start of our chapter to completion of our first project. 
And some of the major reasons and difficulties we had was the first was a limited credibility. Um, just being a new chapter um, at a new campus, or not a new campus, a <laughs> new chapter on a campus, um, it was very difficult. It was very, very difficult. We had to get our, our word out there. We did a lot of fundraising, a lot of advertising to spread the word. Uh, we also lacked a project direction, um, which ties into this financial direction. And really, the difficulty we found is that um, to, make, to travel and complete a first project, or at least even learn what type of project you'd like to complete, you have to have money. And to raise money, you also have to have a project direction. And it's this dichotomy that's really hard to balance initially. And there's also what I'm calling a time lag. Um, essentially, once you've finally decided on a project direction, it takes months to years to get that, the finances in and apply for grants and foundation opportunities and finally implement your projects. So our approach was starting with an on-campus approach. We began with fundraisers, uh, lots of advertising. We took lots of pictures when we traveled so we could bring back that media um, and present it to the campus community and grow our relationship on campus. We developed those relationships uh, to the local community. Uh, we do small um, fundraising events. We'll go down to our local community and uh, solicit for gift cards, donations, and we take those gift cards and donations and present them to the professional community um, in a silent auction. So we, we compile the gift cards, we hold a silent auction. Um, the other items we sell at the silent auction are um, different cultural artifacts, or artifacts, <laughs> uh, touristy items that we purchase down in country. We have our student, students that travel spend 20 to $30 on these items, and the, the chapter subsidizes or matches that equal amount. We bring them back, we present them to the professional community, and it gives them kind of this cultural experience, and they're able, it helps them, lubricates the donations, and kind of encourages um, some funding in that way. And through those professional relationships we develop, uh, we're able to apply for these grants and work through the different foundations. In terms of our professional mentor, um, his name is Todd Wang, and he works for CH2M Hill, and he was the, the sole person that really gave us that opportunity for that funding. So really, I encourage you to always grow those professional community relationships. Um, they really help for fundraising. Um, in terms of community relationships while you're traveling, uh, one of the greatest things I'll recommend, especially on a personal level, is you have to learn, love, play, eat with, cook with, help, and especially be helped by the people you encounter. Um, this, is, this picture is also a great example of this. This is actually during our implementation, and we have um, one of the people we're working with, we encouraged them to use the auto level with us. So we had them working uh, using technical survey equipment, and um, obviously as engineers we double-checked everything uh, when they were complete with their, their surveying. But uh, really involving the people you work with very heavily in your project. Um, in addition, uh, definitely the implementation and holding of um, community meetings is essential. Uh, one of the greatest things, or most important things about to do while you're holding these meetings, really emphasize that the projects are theirs. They're not our projects. We're technical support, but ultimately it's absolutely their project. You have to create this, this great sense of buy-in. Um, and at a technical level, one of the ways we do this is using a memorandum of understanding. And I, I know this is EWB required, or USA, EWB USA required. Is this required for other international groups? You heard of this? No? Great, okay. So essentially, it's a, it's a document we laid out before we travel, and it outlines exactly what we're planning to do for the project, makes it very clear for the community members we work with exactly what we're trying to accomplish. And then at the end of the document, we had about three pages, similar to what you see here, that outlines the role and then the responsible party. So it lays out very clear expectations for who will be doing what and who's involved. In this case, LC is the La Conquista. That's our municipality that we worked with. BC is the bridge committee. So during our community meeting and during this discussion, we set up a bridge committee. Um, it can, um, there were four, four men and five women, or, excuse me, <laughs> Uh, five people in total, four men and one woman that composed this committee, and they were our direct contact with the community. So whenever we needed, say, to coordinate labor or material care and storage, we contacted them directly, and they would go out and coordinate those items for us. Uh, we also have B2P, Bridges to Prosperity, listed. Um, they act mostly as a technical resource for us, um, providing some logistical support in country, but also um, materials acquisition and the cables for the bridges. And finally, EWB um, being our student chapter and EWB USA as a whole. 
Um, so you can see these listed roles here. Uh, we also outline all of the materials we'll be using. Um, in this case, we don't have the quantities listed because we were still deciding exactly how much we would need. But we very clearly laid those out. Um, this is really small, but additional more materials. And then finally, um, down in this middle lower section, you see a lot of the BC responsible party. Sand, gravel, river rock, dressed stone, lumber. Those materials that they can more easily um, um, find or, or purchase uh, as necessary. And by laying out this document and working in this way, we're able to receive a community contribution, contribution or community buy-in of over $4,600. Um, and our contribution as EWB at B2P chapter was actually, it was actually, this is a high number, it was actually more like $20,000 um, in the end. So they contributed between 18 and 20 to 25% of this entire project cost, um, which I was incredibly surprised by. Uh, EWB USA now requires a 5% Yes, <laughs> um, minimum, and we've more than exceeded that. I didn't. I actually didn't think it was possible. So um, I think really the memorandum of understanding and growing those community relationships have allowed us to really prosper in that way, or the community too. Oh, in addition, um, when we arrived on site, this is before we had ever implemented anything as a student chapter. So we arrive on May 10th um, of this year, and this is already done. Um, this was all constructed by a skilled mason that we pay and hire. He hires masons below him, and then we have in-country logistical support, um, some trained engineers, as well as obviously the community and all of their labor, and they constructed this beginning part of the entire project. Um, the left side, there's a two-meter hole and two meters of foundation. The right side's comparable, large excavations off the back and off the front. And they did this all with us, without us in-country. Um, and it really showed that they trusted us and believed in us, and they were willing to implement this before we ever even arrived uh, to work with them, which is fantastic. <laughs> um, in terms of our logistical support, uh, we are an Engineers Without Borders chapter and a British Prosperity chapter. And I think it's a really fantastic opportunity when you take the, our organization, uh, EWB, international chapters, and you partner them with other organizations. Um, in this case, there's really two different development models that are in play. We primarily use the development model of EWB USA, but we use the technical resources in terms of bridge design and material acquisition, mostly from Bridges to Prosperity. So I really don't just, don't get locked in necessarily just to us, reach out and really grow within all development, because that's ultimately what everyone is trying to do, and if we can partner and grow in different organizations, that's just as powerful. In um, addition, uh, we're, part, we're with the Colorado School of Mines, so we get a lot of technical resources and uh, professional development and work from them. Um, and the two men I have here on the left is Doug Effinger. He is our um, basically president of NECA Impact. It's our in-country NGO. Um, and we put him to work, which I think is another a great takeaway, is when you have these partners and these other people that you're working with, put them to work if they're in-country. Um, but let them buy into the project on a personal level. Uh, he also supplies us with all of our um, bookkeeping and whatnot when we're in-country, which is really useful, too. It keeps the process running smoothly. On the right, we have professional mentor Todd Wang. He's been with us. Uh, he works for CH Tomb Hill, and he's been with us for oh, probably about four years now, um, helping us develop these bridge projects. And he's been so influential in our chapter and our growth. Oh, this is a great one, too. <laughs> this group of men are rehab patients um, suffering from alcohol addiction and other drug addictions. Um, they have a rehab center in the community we work with. So when we arrived in country, we made the mistake of coming down during planting season, and all of the people we work with, the community members, are subsistence farmers. So they were, for, for about three in the morning till the middle of the day, they were locked into their duties for their families and all of those requirements. So we, went, we didn't have labor, <laughs> which was frightening. It was very frightening. That was a big mistake on our part. But we were able to reach out to this, this community organization, these rehab patients, and we had 20 to 50 of them work with us every single day for the four weeks that we were down in country, uh, which was, we, there's no way we could have completed the project without them, absolutely not a chance. <laughs> uh, and they, they were fantastic, great group of men. Uh, they worked all day with us. Um, lastly, I wanted, as far as the logistical support, we've been trying to set up a relationship with the uh, National Engineering University in Nicaragua, and we're having some difficulties. Ideally, what we're trying to do uh, is get a group of their civil engineering students to come partner with us on these projects um, to help them grow and help them develop their, their practical engineering skills. 
Um, I'd love to talk more of you on a personal level about this relationship and how you could maybe consider this. Um, but ultimately, we want to grow them, and ideally, we could get them to a position where they may be interested in conducting their own projects in country um, or working with EWB. You mentioned in your presentation that you are looking to involve some civil engineering students in Nicaragua in your project. What do you think is the role that they can play in your project? Yeah, so as we see it, we're looking at taking civil engineers and involving them in the design of the bridge, um, as well as coming down or going into site with us and um, actually implementing the projects, working with the local communities, and hopefully growing their capacity of students and um, their, their excitement to do this kind of work um, within their own country. Um, ultimately, we would like to help them, or help them consider the opportunity to work as an Engineers Without Borders chapter or organization within Nicaragua um, and just solely work within their own country and obviously other international communities as well if they're so interested. Uh, so big takeaways for the day. Um, really encouraging your chapters to grow their credibility and grow their finances from that small scale starting, in our case, starting from our school to the local community to the professional community and ultimately to a global community. Uh, really have to take a, a bottom-up approach. Um, also, this, this is kind of a fun one, the taking thousands of high-quality photos. Um, this is something we overlooked very early on as a chapter. We didn't take a lot of, didn't do a lot of advertising as much as we should have and didn't take enough photos. Um, you bring those photos back and it's really easy to show people what you're doing and, and they can really visualize it and understand um, what you're doing, which is fantastic. Really helps them buy into your projects. Um, in addition, know the grants and foundation that you'd like to apply for. So as soon as you complete an assessment project or as soon as you've decided on your project direction, you can apply for those grants immediately. Um, obviously, they take a long time to, to um, come to fruition, uh, sometimes months, sometimes years, and that funding is always a, a big limitation, at least in our case, a big limitation. Um, a couple more here. As far as um, developing your personal community uh, relationships, Learn, love, play, help, and be helped by those people. I guarantee that yourselves and they will grow so much from the experience. Um, set very clear monetary, logistical, housing, food, transportation, coordination um, expectations. When you lay those out like that memorandum of understanding, it becomes very clear what both parties are trying to accomplish uh, together. Uh, very important. Um, and finally, seek out any opportunities for logistical support. Uh, different NGOs, professional mentors, um, the, the rehab center. You never know what kind of help you can find. Are there any questions? <laughs> Thank you, Taylor. Hello, uh, Nader from Lebanon. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, Vivas, can I ask more than one question? Yeah, but, but before, before we start, what was the truck doing in the river? I, I didn't get this point. Oh. Uh, this, this truck that was stuck in the river. Right, right. Um, it was, I don't know why it was in the river. That is a great question. This, this was supposed to be, they, they just crossed the river. Uh, yeah, anyway. this was, it was actually the mayor of the community. Um, and he was trying to help. Trying this to help was marketing, I think. He, was, he just did this photo to send it to you. Yeah, to get, yeah, to get us down there. <laughs> Okay, so so I have just uh, two questions. I understand you're you're uh, you are a group of students at the right. university, right? Right. The the project went over a process of two years. Have you lost some of the workforce, the people you were involved in this? Uh, yeah, I can see it's from January first till May. Yeah. So it's yeah. one and a half years almost. Uh, did you face this problem losing some students throughout the process, or some of Ab them graduated, yeah, absolutely. some of them got engaged yeah. in other? Uh, um, turnover in our chapter is a really big issue. Um, we have students obviously graduating every single year. Um, I came onto the project during the assessment trip and implementation trip. Um, the people that were on the pre-assessment trip, I think two of the six filtered into the assessment trip, and then we never saw them on the implementation trip. So there's always this constant turnover. And really we try to address it by having the students that travel, when they come back they give presentations, and we require that they're involved with the next stage of the project for at least the next semester, so about five months um, following that trip, to make sure we have that transitionary period to the next group that travels. Yeah. Yeah, we, we have this problem a lot with our chapters. So we, we offered at, uh, at our NGOs that those who are 
student members of our organizations, they get the first year to be members in our NGO for free. Hmm. But then we, we lose them. They, they just graduate, they travel, yeah. they go somewhere else. I don't know. Yeah. So uh, one other question, this is my last question, about the, fu the funding. Can we go to the slide where, where you say it's 4,000? Yeah, one uh, where you show the numbers. Oh, yeah. The community and the... Yes. So what do you mean by community contribution? It's the local community inside that village? Yeah, the, the municipality, the small government center that they operate within. Um, really, it came in the form of uh, they, they hired a skilled laborer of Mason for us, or for the project, I shouldn't say for us, for the project. Um, they also supplied sand, gravel, river rock. Um, they had to rent trucks out to haul 300 cubic meters of river rock. It's a lot of river rock. So it's <laughs> and they kind, collected all of it, so it's all of those contributions. It's in kind contribution. That, that uh, they did. It's like some of it was, yeah, yeah, some of it was. And the other, the $20,000, uh, this was raised by EWB. By, by the, your chapter, right? Right, right. Um, uh, basically entirely from Alcoa and CH2M Hill for all the project materials costs. Um, and then additional funding came through lots of small donors. Um, companies like Schlumberger, Shell, ExxonMobil would donate to us. And we use those types of funds to, to send students. And we actually, our students don't have to pay anything to travel. Actually, this year they have to pay $100. That's the buy-in. The, the on-campus uh, fundraising that you did that was applicable for this project, the, the yeah. on-campus. Can you just give me the, the percentage of the on-campus uh, fund or the contribution it made to the twenty thousand dollars? Okay. Um, probably mm, on campus was probably about four thousand for the year. So about four thousand for this project. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, um, Dennis. Mm -hmm from Cameroon, EWB Cameroon. So uh, thank you for the presentation, very nice. And uh, I'm really interested on uh, the MOU signed with uh, the communities. Yeah. And you know, for an MOU, an MOU is uh, between two parties and uh, I'm like interested on knowing at the level of uh, the community, uh, who was in charge to sign and uh, how the representative was chosen because uh, in Cameroon, let's say in Africa in general, we have uh, a situation where uh, in local communities, local communities have been, uh, let's say, uh, conducted by traditional chiefs. Mm -hmm. And um, he's the man who is probably the, the one representing the, the community. Yeah. Okay. But once, once come a local development project, then there is a community board put in place to manage all uh, local projects. So I just want to have uh, a clear idea of how this was conducted within your project. So first part of that was who did we have sign that document? Is that what I understood? Okay. Um, essentially we had the mayor was the primary signee. And following the mayor we had two different community leaders that um, basically said, yes, I will help coordinate labor, I will help do this and that. We had representatives from each bridge or the bridge committee, they signed the document. And then we also had um, three additional signatures from the landowners right around that site, so that's more of a technical um, in that way. And then myself and um, one or two of the other chapter members signed the document. Um, and then actually when we were, when we're in this community meeting and we're going through this documentation, uh, it's, it's a pretty large document, I think it's around 8 to 10 pages, and we have an English and a Spanish version, and we sit down and we step through the document line by line with them, so that in, in Spanish in this case, so that they clearly understand exactly what we're trying to present to them. And we open that up for questions um, and go from there. Does that answer your question? Sure? Okay. Okay. Um, we have time for one last question over here. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I'm Andrew. I'm was yeah. helping to organize this. Um, I'm, so if we, if we put to, to one side for a second the project, the technology, mm -hmm. can you tell me a little bit about what changed for you and for the people there, particularly with the idea that what mindset changed, what, you know, in the way that you thought about um, the practice, the work of engineering, did you feel like you became more of a global engineer? Were there people in the community that you were working with that you saw change from being sort of laborers to becoming global engineers? 
Interesting. Yeah, I saw a lot of changes in myself. Um, let me think about this for a second. <laughs> That's a, yeah. Um, one of the biggest things I thought is originally when we talk about the country, Nicaragua, when we're working down in country, we talk about all their struggles and the difficulties and how you know they're poor and they, they really struggle to live and and maybe it seems like they don't enjoy their lives or they have really tough times and they do. But when you get down in there and you're spending time with these community members, that's not at all what it's like. It doesn't seem like that. They're laughing, they're playing, they're loving. Um, so it, it flipped my whole perspective on the people that we're working with. Um, instead of, and, and kind of twisted my, okay, we're going to help them into, like, because we're, we're engineers and we just, we just go and we want to help, we're going to do this, 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 to kind of this, um, we're, they're helping us and we're helping them and it's really this, this cooperation. Um, that's absolutely fantastic. And yes, they don't have the technical resources, but that's why we're there. But they have this this great social resource um, that we can utilize, and it was a wonderful experience. Can't wait to do it again. I hope I can travel again. <laughs> I graduate this year. Yeah. Thank you, Taylor. Thanks. Thank you.